my name is Daniela Waldfogel. I'm the Chief Policy Officer of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce and I'm delighted to welcome you to this third webinar of NUSEC where we will explore and discuss current events and trends. And today we will explore the topic winning the future of retail. So the retail industry is undergoing a great transformation and the pandemic has even furthered the need to be uh, be innovative, be bold, uh, as consumer behavior is moving faster towards e-commerce, towards convenience and towards service. So this has accelerated a few on already ongoing trends. Uh, the industry is changing rapidly. Some say it's changing completely right now. During today's webinar, uh, we're going to focus on the broad area of retail uh, and some subcategories. So we're going to look closer at online versus offline. We're going to look closer on the topic, what's next, what's behind the corner, and also on investing in retail in the Nordics and the Baltics. And I'm very happy to introduce my joining guests here today, uh, four of the absolutely most dominant players within the retail industry in the Nordics in Europe. Um, uh, with me, I have Jarno, Jarno van Hattapio, the CEO and founder of Naked.com. That is an online fashion retailer that is one of Europe's top 20 fastest growing companies. Jarno has also founded Zuzu.com and Nelly.com, two of the largest e-commerce companies in Sweden. We also have Lars Åke Tollemark. Lars Åke is uh, the Nordic CEO of Unibel Rodamco Westfield, who owns and operates 89 shopping centers around the globe, among others, the flagship here in Stockholm, Mall of, Sc Mall of Scandinavia, and Fisketorvet outside of Copenhagen. We also have uh, Tatiana Tezel joining us from London, um, the um, deputy fund manager for the European Value Add Real Estate Funds, BlackRock Europe Property Fund 5 and 4. And with us, we also have Max Barclay, the head of NUSIC Advisory, the full service property house in no Northern Europe with an advisory and property asset manage management. So thank you all for joining us this morning. So let me start by a simple question. And I would like a simple and short answer to this first question. Um, from where you're standing right now, if you were to mention one single factor that will affect the retail market the most during the upcoming year, year of 2021, what would that be? Tatiana, let's start with you. Thank you, and uh, what a great question. Um, there are so many, uh, for sure. Um, one, uh, I would say, I think, survival instincts of humans. Thank, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, over to you, Lars Oke. Well, the vaccine. <laughs> and over to you, Jarno. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, we also say vaccine, but I would um, uh, another answer is also the, the behavior of the landlords. OK, and Max, please. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to say COVID-19. Um, I would like to give another answer, but I can't. OK, so interestingly enough, uh, you had uh, a bit of a different answer to that question, and that gives us a hint of the complexity of the issues that we're going to discuss the next hour. So let uh, us start with our first topic of the morning, online versus offline. So Jorno, I would like to start with you. All data suggests that online shopping will continue to increase and that COVID-19 has thrown us a few years into the future. What is your view on the online development uh, of retail right now? now yeah I, I back you on that I think you know I have the visibility in so many e-commerce players I know you know so many operators around the world and I ask you know I get the insights from them and of course I mean we saw a anabolic effect in Q2 all of us uh, that came from nowhere that we couldn't explain a little bit more of a kind of a, a normal Q3, but still there's a kind of an underlying macro that is is very strong. I mean, it's it's very it's very simple. I mean, that money that is traded on the high street needs to go somewhere, and it's of course the only option left is online. Okay, so so um, how much of this development is pandemic related? Would you say? I mean, you, I don't think anybody's sure about the consumer sentiment out there uh, right now and forward you know if you're there's a lot of products that you don't buy today that you normally bought in your life you know you, you don't buy party wear today you don't 
there's a lot of things you don't buy today due to the pandemic. So, I mean, those companies suffer a lot. Then you have the companies that has gone really, really well. Uh, and if you have a combination of, let's say, online and you are in a certain category that is pandemic friendly, so to say, like gym wear and, and lounge wear and that, they have seen incredible uh, uplifts. And of course, things will normalize. It, it always does. I mean, end of the day, when we start partying again, you will look at your closets. It's full of uh, lounge wear you will turn into want to buy more uh, polyware. So it, it will all, always kind of uh, even out in the long run, I think. Would you like to elaborate a bit on how you would say that the pandemic has changed consumer behavior and has anything surprised you? I mean, we look at our cohorts really, really closely, our customer cohorts and the behavior of our customers. And, and when you start shopping online, there's a tendency that you stick to it. So I think that's, there's a kind of huge intake of new customers, especially older customers that have, you know, the elderly that can't uh, shop offline and or don't dare to do that. They, you know, so you have a lot of uh, um, stores online that is doing well with the new consumers as well that has joined on. But uh, what we will see, which I predict, is that of course when we get liberated again and then kind of go to Los uh shopping malls, I think there will be a little bit of us. Uh, settlement on uh, the growth on um, online and then it will uh, rise again. But I think we will get, see a, a, a slight uh, uh, decline in the growth rate. But uh, all in all, yeah, this uh, pandemic has uh, fast forward the development, I would say, three years or so. Uh, would you say that this group of elderly, are they are they there to stay online or do, do, they, do you believe that they will return to offline shopping after this is over? I think yeah, what we see is that when you start shopping online, it's a good be, it's a good experience. You tend to kind of stick to it. But of course, there will be this. I, even I have an urge that I want to go to a shopping mall, just you know, uh, stroll around a little and eat some food and meet some friends. You know, and that that is a strong uh, factor as well, which we shouldn't underestimate. So I think uh, when we the floodgates are open, we will uh, see that uh, booming again. But overall online is a winner on this for sure okay so one last question to you on this on this topic um we know that retailer must uh, they must meet customers wherever they are whenever they want on and on whatever device the customer wants uh, what would you say is there a right blend between e-commerce and face-to-face -face, uh, retail an ideal mix online versus offline yeah, we, we spend a lot of uh, time to interpreting data on this and we do customer surveys. And if you look at Germany, which is our biggest market for Naked, we the second uh, biggest reason how they discovered the brand was uh, through offline uh, stores. Uh, we don't operate our own stores, but we have almost a thousand selling points uh, in, uh, in Germany. So we see that the countries where we are have this omni-channel approach, uh, it, it works much better for us. And, you know, if you ask the consumers, this is how they want to meet us. They want to meet us wherever they are. If they are in a, in a mall or if they're on the bus and on their mobile or if they're at home at their desktop, they don't draw the boundaries as we do. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think, you know, I think definitely that, you know, uh, a direct-to-consumer brand like us needs to have a physical presence as well. But, you know, I just don't see the market... Uh, rationals in terms of the PNL to make sense right now for us to open 100 stores. We would like to, but the PNL just doesn't make any sense at this point. Okay, over to you. Thank you, Jarno. Over to you, Lars Åke. Uh, I would like you to elaborate a bit on uh, how the coronavirus has affected your destinations. Uh, how have the last nine months looked for you? It's the uh, as we are a listed company, so I can only comment up until end of September, uh, uh, which was the latest quarterly report. But what we see uh, and what we discussed before we just opened the session is that it's a big city pandemic. Uh, it's mainly the big cities, it's mainly the big destinations that are suffering the most. Uh, in our case, of course, the Arena City is closed, France Arena is closed, so Moldo Scandinavia is suffering more than the other shopping centers. It's a bit of uh, revenge for smaller local shopping centers uh, uh, that are more or less not affected uh, in Stockholm, if you take Nakasolna, etc. Uh, 
uh, when people are working from home. Uh, but when we look at that, and of course there has been, I mean, uh, for quite some time, like six, seven, eight weeks during the spring, uh, Sweden was the only country where the shopping centers were open and the rest uh, in the world, the 12 countries where we are, it was all closed. So of course, when we lose 95% of the business, there's a huge impact, uh, of course. Um, what's interesting in what Jarno says is, is of course, that, that um, uh, uh, the, the online versus the offline. I mean, this was a trend that has been ongoing for a long time. And when you look at Unibail with Uncle Westfield, what we have done is that we have really concentrated uh, our portfolio over the last 10 years. When I joined Unibail 10 years ago, I had 16 shopping centers. Today I have five. I sold all the small, I sold everything, you know, that I think will not survive or that I cannot develop because I have a piece of land. Will we build more retail? At the moment, no, we don't think so. Will we build offices, uh, healthcare, etc.? Yes, we will, uh, because we have the best, uh, 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 the best places. We are in the heart of the cities. We are in the destinations. We can always, you know, transform. The thing with the COVID is mainly that what I thought I already started the journey when we started the journey in Unibail, but when we thought we might have, you know, two to three to four years, it's actually two to three to four months instead. This is the big effect of the of the COVID, the transformation of some retail space into other activities. And that will take, you know, a couple of years to do. But what would you say? Do you see an overcapacity in existing uh, existing or planned retail floor space over the next two years? I I, I think that uh, I think that the, the the what we see already. I mean, we saw this already before COVID, and it's just been accelerated a lot by the COVID impact. Is that the retailers are getting more picky with the locations? And you can, you can take, for example, if take models come there, has been fully let for five years. We have not had a single square meter for more than five years. Uh, we opened during this time, this year, you know, the new Uniqlo, the new Rituals, the Mill Store, it's, uh, the Decathlon and uh, the Victoria's Secret. We opened this year. So uh, there is still, you know, a need for good retail space for the brands, but they will be much more picky. That's what I think. And then if there is an oversupply or not, you know, that will be, I, I totally agree with Jarno that the big difference that I believe is that the plus 70 or plus 65 went online and discovered how convenient it is to get your groceries to the door instead of going down, you know, to the grocery store, trying to carry everything when you're 70 or 75 or 80, like my mom. So a, a huge flagship mall, such as Mall of Scandinavia, for example, is not only filled with retail, but with experiences, with gaming, food and beverage, jump yards, so, and so on. Um, uh, during normal conditions, what would you say is the <coughs> ideal mix between tenants in a huge mall? Well, I, I think when we launched Mall of Scandinavia already from the beginning, about 35% uh, of the floor space was not retail or traditional retail. It was entertainment with 6,000 square meter sports bar, bowling, uh, adventure mini golf, uh, the biggest state of the art cinema with the IMAX, which has been one of the most successful cinemas in the world, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, we already had at that time a 65 to 35% split on that. Uh, and of course there is a question, you know, where, where is the, what is the lowest touching point for retail to still think it's a good experience? There's one thing I don't agree with Jarno. Jarno said that shopping online is a good experience. No, it's not. I'm sorry, my friend. It's not. Uh, shopping offline is a very good experience. That's my view. Jarno, you have to answer to that before we, we <laughs> let uh, Tatiana and Max come in. Is shopping online not a good experience? I always say that consumers uh, waltz with their feet and right now they, the feet stares to online but uh, I, do, I, believe, I do believe that the combination is the magic here and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's my belief. Okay, thank you. So Tatiana, uh, listening to Jarno and Lars Åke, it sounds like we need to stop treating online and offline uh, as an as an either or scenario. Uh, consumers want both. From an investor's perspective, uh, what do you say? I think that's um, absolutely right. Um, I think we are heading towards a new normal. 
um, I don't think we will be going back to you know old ways of of shopping, uh, of course, or or working, or you know any of these trends, you know, have been just exposed and by COVID and and will be, you know, are accelerating and will be doing so into the future. Um, so. Absolutely. I think, you know, there will be people um, that cannot wait to go back to malls and do the face to face or in person shopping. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, there will be also still a lot of people who will, you know, be scared and, and mentally a little bit, you know, scarfed by, by, the, by the whole health crisis. And it will take time for these people to gain the confidence around health and safety and, and return. So, yeah, we, we do need the, the balance. So what do you say about this ideal mix between offline and off, uh, online retail? Has that changed during the last six months, given the changes in behavior during the pandemic? And has it ch changed like permanently, do you think? Well, now we lost your sound, so mm -hmm. let's take uh, the question over to Max. What is your view on what we have heard thus far? Well, I, I totally agree with uh, with Janro and, and Lars Åke. Uh, I think that um, you know there, there, this pandemic has really uh, accelerated trends that we have already seen uh, in the market. Uh, I think it's also important to point out that uh, you know from my point of view, I understand that it's it's troublesome for for Unibail when 95% of the the shopping centers are closed, but coming out of this. Uh, I see that they are going to be the winners uh, with good location, with with the volume, uh, with experiences that you you offer the the, the offline shoppers. Uh, but I also think it's important to to understand that there is going to be losers in this, mm. um, and there are shopping centers uh, and there are sh shopping destinations that's going to have a, a really troublesome uh, way out of this. Um, so, not everything is good. Okay, so the existential crisis for, for some locations is quite huge, you would say. Yeah, I think that if, you, you know, I think that the, the trend is, is clear that, uh, you know, the consumer behavior is changing. Uh, but that means that, uh, you know, the smaller destinations, the ones that are not located where they should be, they're going to gonna have to, to look at their strategies and, and change them. Okay, what you say, uh, not located where they should be, what kind of locations are you talking about? Well, I think, you know, where people are not moving, where it's uh, hard to, to get, it's not uh, easy access, uh, you know, it's not enough uh, pick, uh, take up from, from people. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, in, in general, I, I also agree with Lars Åke that, that locally there, there will be things that still is going to work. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, smaller destination close to Lars Åker's destination is going to going to have a uh, going to be struggling. OK, uh, so uh, according to statistics, Max, from, for example, the Swedish Trade Federation, they say that 70 percent of all retail uh, shopping will still take place in physical stores in 2030 uh, in comparison to to 90 percent today. Uh, do you think that this will still be the case in 10 years or has like the pandemic disrupt uh, disruption um, changed this? I think it has increased the pace. I think that we have uh, jumped ahead, uh, you know, three to five years. Uh, uh, Darno said three years. Uh, I don't know. It remains to be seen. But I think that we have jumped ahead in, in time uh, and the speed and the, the force of, of this change has, has just increased. So, um, you know, going from 90 to 70 percent is a, is a huge difference. Uh, Jarno and Lars Åke, I would like to ask you a question about retailers um, having to become more innovative in the competition for for uh, clients uh, and for customers. Uh, what do you say about that, Jarno? Will any retailer that simply turns back uh, the lights on and reverts to traditional business models, are they doomed when it comes to offline retail? I don't think you need to be, you know, it's not about innovation and end of the day, you know, if people talk about showrooms and I had never understood showrooms. If I go and want to go offline, I want to get the product with me, not looking at a screen at it and that I can do at home, right? So uh, 
I do, what I do believe is true today, you cannot build a brand uh, starting from offline today, which was the case for uh, you know many years ago where you could do that. What Naked does is that we started online five years ago and we have, uh, during Black Week right now, we attract roughly 1.3 million visits a day right now. Uh, normally it's uh, half of that, around six, 650,000 uh, visits a day. And you start by creating a demand uh, demand online, and then you can profit it uh, offline on it. And when, when, you, when we open our store in the Mall of Scandinavia, I mean, a lot and watch for the long lines that we had there, but it was because we had an online demand for the brand. And uh, you cannot do the opposite today by thinking that you can start offline and then you go online. It's it's the it's you need to be online for a while. Then you can uh, look at uh, starting offline stores. Okay. But you don't have to be that innovative. It obviously it comes back to the brand and product. But if you have a good brand and product uh, and a demand, then uh, physical retail makes a lot of sense. Lars okay. what is your view on that? But I, I agree with Jarno. Some of the biggest success we have had are actually. Uh, 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 online brands or brands like Naked or, or uh, a couple of other brands who have uh, had the, the longest queues when opening because their consumers, was re they were really waiting to interact with the brand. They have only seen it online uh, like this. I mean, we had a queue uh, uh, when Naked opened the store in Mola Scandinavia, which was a pop-up in between two other stores, uh, a quite big one though. Uh, the queue was, I don't remember, you know, it was like uh, 700 meters or something like that because the, the consumers wanted to see, okay, what does the naked store look like? And the brand was built online. I think that we saw a trend already before that was accelerating, that was maybe not very public, but it was really pick up in store that it increased. People are very tired of, you know, going to a tobacco store that you never visit any. Uh, uh, at, at any time, except when you need to pick up your parcel from Postnordo, the mail company for your, for it. and the service is terrible, you know. Uh, and the pickup in store increased dramatically over the last six months before COVID, especially in the big chain store companies. And of course, this is increasing as well. And, and I think this is a behavior. And, and I'm not even sure that in 2030 that we will continue to talk about offline, online, you know, what is the proportion of the retail business, etc. Because where do you see? I always take the example of there is a girl on the bus. She sees an outdoor commercial for a Sarah product. She picks it up on the iPhone. She plays an order and she says, OK, I pick it up tomorrow in the store next to it. And then if I need a return, whatever, I mean, it's totally integrated. This is the way it will work. So where does the, the action actually take place in that case? What do we do with the destinations? And we have said for quite some time over the last at least seven, eight years, we believe in three kinds of retail. Maybe we have to regret one of them. I will come back to that. But three kinds of retail. One is convenience. It means what you have in the hub, exactly where you live or, or where your commuter train uh, starts at the station, you know, the things you can carry with you when you go home or when you go to work. And the second one is destinations where you go with a bigger family to meet your friends, which will become much more of let me entertain you shopping center business than regular shopping center business. And then we had travel business, airports, uh, railway stations, etc. And that might change. That will be very interesting because that part was increasing like hell before COVID. And this will be very interesting to see for the future. How long will it take to come back on the travel business? That was taking quite a big part. So uh, I think that no no one knows. The only thing we know is that we need to we need to adapt and we need to adapt fast. In the real estate business, this is a problem, of course, because we like long contracts, secure cash flows, etc. And this is also, you know, why we, we need to challenge maybe our models. Uh, uh, I think this is what Jarno means when he, he always complains about the landlord because he wants a cheap price. But uh, uh, if you want a cheap price, you go to one of those shopping centers that Max was talking about. But, but I think we need to adapt to the business. We need to be pragmatic. We need to get out, you know, of the behaviors we have had for such a long time, you know, and to realize that this is a totally integrated business at this time. 
Tatiana, over to you. It sounds like uh, offline retail or integrated online and offline retail has a very bright future still. Uh, how do you look upon uh, uh, the future of the offline stores and locations and so on? Well, uh, uh, you know, as, as one of the statistics mentioned earlier, um, still 70% of you know, um, shopping happens uh, offline in, in brick and mortar stores. Um, you know, I, I think it's not um, an easy situation out there, whether we talk about retailers or the landlords. Um, you know, the, the retailers clearly are suffering a lot. Uh, it, it will take time to filter through. Um, landlords also need to think about um, you know, redefine their relationship with tenants, you know, explore, you know, newly structures, um, you know, as a result, perhaps may take more operational risk, but it also needs to create, you know, the experiences um, in the retail scheme that, that people cannot really repl replicate at home. Uh, and I suppose all of this um, change needs to take place um before investors can really underwrite uh, risk in in retail and and location is of course i mean we touched on it uh, important um there 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 is polarization in retail there will be winners and and, and losers the retail market will as a, as a consequence probably shrink and those who will um adapt to, to the ongoing change and, and, and the trends we see are are going to be the, 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 the stronger one will we'll emerge strong out of all of this eventually. So who who do you think will be the winners and who do you think will be the losers? Uh, what are, what are so, so to speak, the characteristics of these two groups? I, I think uh, in terms of uh, the winners, clearly at the moment, the, the convenience, the, the groceries, your drug stores, uh, you know, all the uh, discretionary spending, the, these are the winners. So retail anchored um, uh, schemes, uh, that, that is uh, going strong and it's certainly on um, shopping list of investors at the moment. Um, I think the point on, uh, I think uh, mentioned earlier on uh, localization or localism, shall we say, when people work from home and explore more of those uh, uh, retail concepts in their local area is is, is going to uh, be strong for, for a while. Um, yeah, and the, the losers will be indeed, you know, secondary locations, uh, concepts that have been suffering a lot before the crisis. I think it's just going to be exa exaggerated. Max, uh, over to you. Uh, uh, what categories of retail do you think will be the clear winners going forward now? Uh, clothing, fur furniture, essentials, health, uh, when it comes to offline and, and online. What do you think? <coughs> well, I, I agree with Tatiana. I think that, you know, there is... Um, if you look ahead, I think that physically, uh, in the physical uh, world, we're going to have less square meters for retail in 10 years or in 20 years. Uh, and that means that there are going to be losers and there are going to be winners. But it's not as simple to say that it's a certain categories or certain geographies that is is, is going to lose and, and certain are going to win. I think it's, it's general, you can't generalize like that because I think that you know, historically we've said that retail is all about location, location, location. And one of the challenges with the physical world and, and with real estate is that if you build a building, it stays where it is. You can't move it. Uh, it's extremely hard. Um, and, and you have to work with, with what you have. And I think that what it, it's, it's all about adopting to, to the local, um, uh, to, to, to what you have around your real estate. And, and uh, I think that, you know, one of the winners is, is going to be the strategy that, uh, that Lars Hawk and his company has, because I think that the destinations are going to be uh, clear winners if you do it right. Uh, but I think that there's also uh, some that needs to think about um, other ways than, than retail to be the solution. 
um, look at social services and look at logistics and try to change the use of the properties to something that is uh, that works for that certain property in that certain location. Thank you, Max. So we're going to move over to our next topic today. That is what's next. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to tell you all that if you have any questions that you want to ask our participants here today, you can just uh, write them down in the chat area below in your screen. So we're going to stay with you, Max, uh, for a bit here. Um, looking around the corner, trying to look into the crystal ball, into the future, what do you see as the next big thing within retail? Well, I think the trends we have talked about is going to increase uh, more in speed and, and force, uh, but I also think that sustainability is going to be a, a big thing going forward, uh, both for investors, uh, but also for retailers and, and for the one that operates the, the, uh, in the retail market. Um, you know, the, the COVID is going to push this uh, this forward because we're going to uh, we, we need to um, to give people a secure uh, place to meet and 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 uh, uh, something that is sustainable to to go to and um, to stay at and so on. So I think that sustainability um, uh, where we adopt to uh, the change uh, that is happening in society is going to be a, a, a big thing going forward. Jarno, I know that you work a lot with sustainable e-commerce. Uh, what do you think is think is uh, the next big thing? Yeah, I think uh, of course producing this stuff in a sustainable manner is something we work on uh, really heavily on, and, and making sure that all transports are are uh, fossil free and so forth. But overarching all and over, uh, you know the biggest thing we work on is circularity. And I think here retail can play a essential part of our, our circularity projects. We basically, we are integrating a secondhand platform on our current platform, which has been a huge, huge investment for us. And we are uh, just on a beta test on that. And it will be uh, one of the biggest things we push for in 2021. And, I, and I'm looking at, okay, how can we actually... Uh, make it convenient for our customers co to come back with their naked items. And that, uh, in that sense, I think retail could make a, or, you know, physical places could make a, a difference for us. Where we could, so we're looking into actually opening up uh, hubs where we actually just collect the stuff that we want to get back from our customers so we can sell them to other customers uh, and take a kind of a extended responsibility for what we sell and that's the biggest thing for uh, any the you know env environment is to, to make sure that our products get say second and third and fourth life which enables us to produce even less i mean we are very very data driven and we you know we have very little overstock compared to the industry uh, as we are you know uh, much more agile on that but uh, i think the circularity will be the big thing next and i think that will be uh, very helpful to do uh, partially offline as well. So, uh, judging from what you're saying, uh, e-commerce uh, and fast consumption can <coughs> coexist with uh, sustainability. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's uh, <laughs> consumers will need clothes for sure, and uh, they cannot go nude, and and that's a fact. There needs to be. Uh, garments produced and we want to be the top 1% uh, of the fashion companies in the world doing this and we want to take business from other fashion companies. We don't necessarily want the industry to increase in market cap. I mean, we can become a billion dollar company just by taking uh, money from less uh, environmentally friendly producers and that's our that's our big game here that we want to you know, want to you know do so it's not necessarily to grow the market it's actually to take from other players that don't have the muscles or the um, you know the urge to do it as we have Lachoke, you were shaking your head uh, consumption yeah. and uh, sustainability cannot go hand in hand or what do you say no it's it's a uh E-commerce and sustainability cannot go hand in hand. And for those of you out there listening who don't know us, Jarno and I, we know each other very well. So we, <laughs> I like to challenge him and the, the other way around. That's why it started by provoking the landlord thing. Uh, but but to be frank and to be very clear, I think Jarno and other, and, and as we discussed before, my wife has an e-commerce company as well, where Jarno is a small partner, actually. <clears throat> 
Uh, but the e-commerce companies, they do what they can. I, I still, you know, truly they do what they can to do it. But to be frank, e-commerce can never be sustainable. Never, ever, you know. And you you ship a small parcel from all of, uh, over the world to a consumer who will send it back in 40% of the cases and in Germany 50% of returns. That can never, ever be sustainable. And at some point, the consumers will start to ask themselves, is this really sustainable? And then those companies, they are, of course, a part of the big trend. And I totally agree with Max that the next big trend in retail will be we're just in the beginning of sustainability trend. And yeah, I'm okay. sure. Um, I, a little bit. I, I, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, hang on. I think please. I think you do exactly what you what you can do, but you need to explain to me how can it be sustainable with all those transports and logistics. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at a return of a, a pair of shoes or a <clears> pair, <throat> if you if if you stuff that in a truck that is on fossil fuel and it's transported uh, for a while, uh, for a, even if it would go to Germany or Poland or wherever, the 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 impact of that single product is less than 150 meters with your car if you take it to a mall of Scandinavia. Of course, we cannot compete if you are taking a boy or something, but start your car 150 meters, it's as much CO2 as a return down to Poland. So, I mean, in yeah. some cases, e-commerce is better than if you if you live on the countryside and you need to take your car like five, yeah. six kilometers. Yes, uh, but Yes, but Jana, with all the shoes you sell, I can drive back and forth to Mall of Scandinavia 10 times a day with the shoes returns you have. No, but uh, yeah, but on a single <laughs> consumer, on a single consumer, yeah. that so, uh, equals, I mean, so there, there's a big misunderstanding in the footprint. Uh, if you look at the whole CO2 that we have, 10% is coming from uh, the, the transport. And if you look yeah. at the bad bits of the world, they, they already climate compensate that and we do the double on top of that. So right mm -hmm. now we are actually offsetting more on a return than we are, uh, you know, polluting it. So, of course, everybody wants to go to full fossil free and that will happen. But it's a big misunderstanding of the, uh, uh, how much footprint one return has. And this is a very skewed um, uh, discussion. Of course, it sounds bad, but people don't take in mind that, you know, what you do on daily basis, uh, you know, uh, one trip to Thailand is probably all of your returns for a full lifetime. Thank you, Lars Åke and Jarno. I will take this question over to Max and Tatiana. Max, you were waving, please. No, I, I just think that this proves my point. The passionate uh, of the discussion from both Lars Åke and Jarno shows how important this is. And the reason it's important is because it's 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 driven by the consumers. They are demanding this. This is not uh, negotiable anymore. Um, so you know whether or not Lars Åke or Jarno is right, or they are maybe both wrong or right. Uh, I think it just shows how important this is going to be uh, going forward. Tatiana, from an investment point of view, mm -hmm. I know that BlackRock CEO mm -hmm. declared earlier this year that environmental sustainability will be a key goal for investment decisions. When you hear these gentlemen discuss, uh, what uh, what is your take on this? Yes, you're absolutely spot on there with uh, Larry Fink talking uh, about ESG and it being uh, very high on our uh, priority list. So I'm very pleased to hear the conversation is here today about ESG. Um, I think I would perhaps only add that it's on not only about uh, environment and sustainability, but also the, the S and the G, the social and governance of, of the ESG acronym. We all like to sometimes maybe, you know, um, focus mostly on the environment. So in, term, in context of the retail, um, I think... You know, many individuals have already lost jobs, especially those um, shops that, you know, had to close for obvious reasons. I think many individuals will lose more jobs in the coming months. Um, and I think retailers must manage this delicately and, and compassionately uh, to, to maintain a good brand image uh, in situation where this happens because, you know, consumers are way more uh, aware to this and, and so are the investors. Uh, so uh, 
Max and Tatiana, they were saying that this is driven by the consumers. Uh, Jarno, what do you say? The young generation is more conscious than perhaps we are. So on the one hand, they're seeking sustainable products and brands, uh, but are they also less interesting in, interested in consuming per se? And how do you handle that? Yeah, they don't want to possess as, uh, things as the older generations does. But of course, they, we ask them, we talk very closely to them, and we have millions of uh, generations set in our, our database, and we talk closely with them. They say that they, their biggest uh, fear is, of course, the, what's happening with the world and the environment. But they're also hypocrites. They say that loud, out uh, clearly. They, they state themselves that they're hypocrites. So, But we clearly see that it's uh, we are pouring more money into this than we are getting paid back from the consumers, basically. The, but we know that, you know, give it, give it five, ten years, this is a must-have, of course. So, and then we want to be also a, a aspirational brand and we want to take our responsibility in the world. So right now it's costing a little bit more than you're getting back, but it's an investment we all make for obviously the good of, uh, good of things and the brand. Uh, but we see a booming interest for it, and it's it's coming from the new wallets and the new consumers, and the old ones are obviously less concerned. Uh, Max? Uh, I, I just want to make a point of what Jarno is saying. I think that sustainability is not sustainable if it's not financially viable as well. And I think that's what, what, what you know Jarno is pointing out here is that there is actually money to be made in sustainability and, and meeting the change in in, uh, in consumer behaviors, but also that we're generally much more informed and, and aware of these issues. So, um, you know, for me, it's, it's very clear. Uh, and I think that Jarno and Lars Hawke's passion about this question just shows how important this is going to be going forward. Okay, I would like to, before we change to our next topic, I would like to ask you about um, the fact that Amazon uh, recently entered the Swedish retail market. Uh, so Lars Åke and Jarno, I'll start with you. How do you think that this will affect uh, the industry and you? Lars Åke, please. Uh, first, just one, one line about what we just discussed. The, what surprises me the most during the COVID is that people continue to shop. They just changed the area. They went offline to online and they changed to home furniture, uh, redecoration of your house and technic stuff. But when you look at, the, at, at the, the total level of shopping, it's a behavior that people have that they can't get rid of, you know. Despite the pandemic, you know, they continue to shop. Just another behavior. This is the first thing. Amazon, I don't know. The only thing I know is that Amazon in, in the US is huge. Uh, E-commerce in the US is huge. But that's mainly because U.S. had a really big part. I think it was around 50% mail order and it, uh, uh, 20 years ago. And mail order in general went digital. And all of a sudden, you had a big e-commerce sector. And Amazon in the U.S. is totally different from Amazon in Europe. They've been in the U.K. for a long time. I don't know the market share. They've been in Germany for a long time. I don't know the market share. But it's not at as all as in the U.S. And then Sweden. From my point, I don't really understand why they come here. We are a small country close to the polar circle with our own currency, you know. Uh, I, 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 I don't really understand, you know, what, what, why they enter the market. Will it impact the market? Uh, probably yes. How much? I have no clue. Jarno, what do you say? Will Amazon shake the entire Nordic uh, market with its approach to online retailing? No, Amazon, are, they are a fierce competitor for uh, e everyone to think of with their muscles and everything else and uh, what they can do. But we also see that uh, the fastest growing uh, online trend is uh, D2C brand, which is direct to consumer brands, right? It's like naked. We are, we are not selling generic goods. I will never ever in my life sell generic goods again because it's about, uh, you know, obviously about price uh, at the end. So we we are not at all uh, afraid of Amazon. We actually are considering selling on their platform, or we might not do. If we would do it, it's just for pure marketing and uh, reaching new consumers. If we would have 500 products on Amazon and we would have 20,000 products on uh, Naked, which is just a click away, of course it's a superior ex experience. To, but what I like with Amazon, of course, is that they they invested so much in the last mile experience that it has basically 
uh, help the whole industry. So when we see the second re revolution of e-commerce e is when we, you know, we got the bad bees and uh, uh, and those companies coming uh, surface, which is giving a superior home delivery. When PostNode had it in their hand, they were miserable. <laughs> you know, you had to be at home between eight and seven in the evening. Uh, you know, eight in the morning and seven in the evening. And you know, so but uh, Amazon really kind of changed that, and that's been a big driver for e-commerce right now. The convenient home delivery. So. Um, but if I would, of course, if I would sell pet food, I would be terrified of uh, Amazon or if I would sell sports goods or something like that, generic, but they have no chance of disrupting naked. Uh, it's, uh, we sell unique products and, and uh, fashion has proven to be their weak point. Um, so yeah. Ma Max, uh, Jorno says here that he's not at all afraid of Amazon and the competition. Would you say that uh, other retailers that are in a tougher situation facing even uh, like tougher uh, tougher markets uh, right now, uh, would, should they be afraid of the competition from Amazon? I think what Bosos has done and the company that he has built, uh, you know, um, deserves respect. It's an amazing company and, and, and a fantastic journey that they have made. And, and I think it's clear that they're going to compete in, in Sweden as well and, and going to disrupt things. But I agree with Jarno. I think, you know, generic things uh, is going to be challenged and they are going to be challenged in price. Um, uh, unique things is a totally different story. I think that Lars Oak is making a, a very good point. The, the change in behavior is, is going to fall out differently in different parts of the world, depending on how many people live and how dense we live. Uh, so how, how e-commerce falls out in a, in a place like London is totally different from a place like Gothenburg. Um, because, you know, if, if you uh, want to take your car and go to the pop-up naked store in, in Mall of Scandinavia, you know, it takes you 10, 15 minutes and, and you're there. If you want to do the same thing in Los Angeles, you're two hours in car. It, it's, it, 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 it turns out totally different in, in, in how it changes our, our behavior. So I think that the, the penetration and the, 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 uh, the, the change that a, a player like Amazon is going to introduce to the Swedish market is not going to be as great as in other parts of the world. So over to London then, Tatiana, speaking from experience uh, from a country where Amazon has already uh, become an important player, does their market position affect your investment strategy in the UK within retail? That's a very good question. Um, I, I don't I don't think so at the moment. Um, you know, they are certainly a big player. Um, they definitely compete, uh, you know, with many retailers and, and, you know, they're price competitive. They, they're very fast. They can deliver on the same day. If you like, especially in London, you can choose a number of different ways how the product is delivered to you, including lockers, which you can just pick up with, with a code. Um, so you don't need to work around delivery slots, uh, for example. Um, you know, in terms of the overall retail strategy you know that there is still uh, you know a certain belief in in uh, brick and mortar shopping um and i think where amazon perhaps has not succeeded yet very significantly or we don't see significant strides yet is uh, grocery uh, shopping people are getting into it you can buy groceries on amazon um but there are other um, uh, retailers that are, I think, uh, have a bigger, bigger share in, in this area and which I think is important, especially in the context of COVID. So the future will tell Amazon just launched its operations here in, in, in Stockholm and in Sweden uh, this fall. So let's move on to our last topic of this morning, investing in retail in the Nordics. And Tatiana, I would like to stay with you. We were just discussing uh, sustainability. Uh, so would you say that the Nordics and the Baltics, uh, how are these countries from a sustainable investment point of view? when you're looking at retail? Yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's a great question. 
Um, from the point of perspective, listen, you know, look, there's still a lot of uncertainty. That's what the pandemic brought upon us. And retail is certainly one of the hardest hit sectors. Um, I think it is going to get darker before the down. And I, I don't mean it as a just a f figure of speech. I, I think it really applies um, to the period between now when lots of countries in Europe are still, you know, are in second lockdowns or, you know, national or, or local lockdowns um, and the, and the post-vaccine uh, world. Um, I believe, you know, there will be still, there's still some time before we see, you know, uh, investors, you know, uh, going into retail uh, in the way they used to. And I, I think there are perhaps three observations we can make on, on capital markets. You know, there is firstly a uh, rotation of capital in other sectors than retail. We can take logistics um, as an example, which is attracting a lot of capital where tenant demand is there on the back of um, surge of e-commerce. Um, you know, you know, the industry estimates say that for every billion in e-commerce sales, uh, there's a requirement for additional 100 to 120,000 square meters of logistic space. Now, that's extraordinary. Um, so there's certainly <coughs> more um, certainty in logistic sectors than there is in, in retail. And they certainly uh, have a lot more tailwinds than the headwinds that the retail you know, is, is facing. Now, second point I would make um, about capital markets um, would be that in order for investors to allocate capital into retail sectors, they need to be able to underwrite um, or understand, first of all, understand the structural change and, and second, underwrite the risk, which is currently really, really challenging. You know, we, we can all debate how many more lockdowns are we going to see before vaccine is widely rolled out or how many more retailers will have to close uh, down their shops? Now, there are investors out there who do definitely underwrite retail uh, and, and, you know, but I think they do want to be compensated for the, the risk that they, they are taking. And the last point I would make is um, on the capital markets, you know, that we, we are still in the phase of um, the, the pricing discovery. Um, while the, I think I talked about the grocery anchored schemes, the, necess the necessity driven retail being um, perhaps uh, the strong ones, they continue being on the top of the shopping list of investors. Uh, they're trading well, they're still holding their value. Um, it is still pointing to the polarization of the retail sectors. Um, there are also other schemes that have impairments and these will need to offer some discount to the investors to compensate them for taking the risk. Um, so, but, you know, the, there is a quite a lack of transactions in retail sector at the moment. And so we don't quite know yet whether um, uh, it has corrected enough. So that's why I say we are still in the price discovery phase. Max, I would like you to comment on what Tatiana just said and also comment on the question if you believe that there is anything that stands out being specifically Nordic or Baltic uh, compared to other parts of the world. Well, I think governments all around the world are doing what they can to handle the, the situation that we are, are in. Uh, one way is to uh, push more money into the markets uh, and money needs to work and money needs to uh, deliver returns and there are very few ways to to get good returns uh, on money these days but one of them is is real estate so i think that real estate will continue to be a, a very important uh, and popular way of investing money um, I also think that uh, if we look at Nordics from an um, uh, outside in perspective, I think that Nordics seems to be handling the situation better than many others. Uh, Lars Åkers shopping centers are still open, uh, which I think they are happy uh, that they are. Uh, as an example, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, when it comes to investment in real uh, retail, I think that people are generalizing and people are now looking for income where the income is secure, like uh, um, 
logistics or uh, public properties or residential, which is very popular uh, investments right now. And people are more hesitant towards investment where they feel that there is unsecurity and retail being one of them. I think that it's an overreaction. I think there is uh, going to be a lot of good retail going forward. There is going to be some problems. Uh, but I think that there is an opportunity when everybody thinks that uh, the, the segment is under pressure. Um, because that doesn't go for everything. So I think that there will be investment opportunities when, when people are hesitating. Um, talking about what's specific for, for the Nordics, I, I would maybe kind of point out that um, from an outside-in perspective, the Nordics uh, looks like uh, politically stable and uh, you know it's still quite open. It's possible to travel. It's uh, possible to, to actually do deals. Uh, and I think that that kind of stands out, especially in, in Europe. So um, I think that we will have uh, quite an active investment market uh, at the end of this year and it will continue next year. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few questions from the audience here. Uh, one question is for Jarno and Lars Åke. Uh, how will lease agreements look like in the future when it comes to turnover-based rate, uh, rents? How can landlords keep up the rents when sales move from offline to online? Who would like to start? Lars Åke? We lost your sound now. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Um, uh, it's, it's, no, but it's, it's a very interesting question and I'm happy we had it because there is one thing that I think is very important when you talk about landlords and retailers. I mean, we work in the same environment. We are in the same boat, especially companies like URW and, and the retailers. And one thing that is very clear, uh, no one will invest if there is a, a short term, pure turnover rent based contract. If you have a six months contract or one year contract, the landlord will not invest and the retailer will not invest and no one will invest. And if no one invests in physical retail, online will win for sure. And how do you secure the investment? And we know from by heart, you know, that when, you, when we are, especially now when we are pushing a couple of deals forward with one year, whatever, retailers don't invest. When we launched Mono Scandinavia in the market in a different environment, I agree. But it was the retailers actually asking for five years, seven year, 10 year contracts. We wanted shorter because we wanted to, you know, uh, we were so sure it would be a success that we could actually benefit from having short contracts. But you need to secure the investment. When you go to your supervisory board and you say, hey, I'm going to open a new store or I'm going to open a new shopping center, you need to have some kind of security for your investment. And what happens if everyone is asking for a six months contract on a turnover base. No one will invest in physical retail. And I spoke to um, a quite big retail company in Sweden and to a member of a supervisory board. And you know what they said? We didn't think about this. We didn't think about it, you know. We just ask, we want to have this. Yeah, but what happens long term if you continue to do that? This is one thing. The other thing is, of course, it's totally depending on the strength of your assets. As I said, Mall of Scandinavia, we have opened Victoria's Secret, Decathlon, Rituals, Uniqlo, Me Store this year only in that case. When you see our quarterly report, you can see that I have signed 200 leasing deals and I lost 1% MGR, which is minimum guaranteed rent. I lost 1% in this environment on that one. Yeah, no, I can tell you. Would you like to I make a short you. comment on that? We're, we're running yeah. out of time here. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, no, please, a short comment. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, making a bet on a location today is very, very hard for you, first of all. And, uh, you know, we're looking at concepts that can move even if you stay there for two years or if you stay there for six months. We need to have a concept that is uh, we can assemble quickly and uh, dismantle quickly. And, you know, the times of, of uh, investing 10 million kroners or 20 million kroners into one store and one making one bet on one location that we wouldn't do. And for the alternative investment we can do today is obviously the online growth. So right now we, we it's you know if we want to invest 10 million kroners and get a quick return or a semi quick return we do it online. But I do agree that you know we we do need to one reason why we didn't uh, do more pop ups is that you know you want to make sure that the experience in those stores is is high enough to make sure justify you know make justice for the brand 
and that's hard to do when you do a, you know a pop up too too simple so i think we need to invest more i'm i'm totally in line with that but end of the day it's about footfall and rent i mean if we create footfall for you guys uh, and you you claim that you have this kind of footfall and then you don't and you still want to have the same rent as you wanted to have 2 years ago then we have a problem but so who creates the footfall is it us or you and uh, that's uh, that's a discussion I want to have with a lot of uh, uh, landlords. Okay, so one absolutely last question, and you get five seconds each to, to answer it. What would you say is the one key factor to succeeding in the retail segment? Please, Max, start. Knowing the consumers. Tatiana. I will go back to my survival instincts. Jarno. I need to have a strong brand today. Lars Hoke. Uh, it's uh, concentration. Thank you all so much for being with us this morning. Uh, take care and stay tuned for new sex next sessions and bye from Stockholm for now.